Hello, my name is Jim Capretta. I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I am pleased to welcome you to today's discussion on price transparency in healthcare. My guest for this conversation is Chris Severin, the CEO and co-founder of Turquoise Health, which is a data technology company focused on improving the healthcare payment system by leveraging the information now available from rules requiring pricing disclosure. The plan for today is to have Chris provide some short introductory comments outlining how he sees the price transparency landscape shaping up over the coming months and years. It's obviously been a very turbulent time, lots of new rules being implemented, and so the landscape is changing rapidly. And Chris is, there's nobody per better than Chris to help us navigate what's going on out there. After Chris finishes his comments, I will engage him in a conversation by asking some questions and perhaps making a few comments myself. Near the end of our program, I will turn to a small number of audience questions we have received during the course of the event. If you would like to ask a question, you have two options. You can send them by email during the event to katrinafee at aei.org. That name is spelled C-A-T-R-I-O-N-A dot fee, F-E-E, -E, at A-I dot org. The spelling of this email is also on today's event webpage, which can be found at A-I dot org. Alternatively, viewers can send their questions to Katrina via Twitter by using the hashtag AskAEIHealth. That's AskAEIHealth. So there's much to discuss because the environment, as I said, for disclosed pricing is changing rapidly. New federal transparency requirements went into effect in January 2021, some earlier versions as early uh, went going back to 2019. These rules affect hospitals and insurers the most, but also now physician practices and others. The 21st Century Cures Act required additional steps that are now only now starting to become operative. To help us understand all of this, how this is playing out, as I said, there's no one better than Chris to help us see where we're going with this new environment. Prior to starting Turquoise Health, Chris spent 10 plus years modeling hospital managed care contracts at CloudMed as a product manager. And then more recently, he headed machine learning projects for hospital payment integrity at Arcosta. Chris co-founded Turquoise Health to build software products focused on price transparency compliance, managed care benchmarking, and contract negotiation for providers, payers, and employers. Since launching in 2020, Turquoise has aggregated 4,000 plus, 4, plus hospitals price transparency disclosure data in a central repository and made this new data actionable to industry for the first time in its hospital rates database. Chris's goal is to cultivate basic economic forces in healthcare pricing while simplifying how care gets paid. Chris holds a BS in business administration from UC Berkeley. Thank you, Chris, for taking the time to join us today. Really appreciate your, uh, your in a startup business with lots going on. So thank you for this time today. <laughs> Please proceed with any initial comments you'd like to make. Yeah, Jim, thanks for having me. And it's, it's a topic I love to talk about. So, you know, like, like you mentioned, I'm working with Turquoise Health and we're a startup two years old and we're working in an industry, in a niche of the industry that moves very slowly, changes very slowly. And so you mentioned the word rapidly. Um, so these three big laws that are propelling price transparency at the federal level are really pushing the industry into hyperspeed. And so the last two years have been very busy um, consolidating the data from the hospital rule, now consolidating the data from the payer rule, and then we have no surprises, which has been rolling out. And what all of these laws do together is they really put pressure on how payers and providers negotiate care, um, both from a price perspective and from a process perspective. How are these contracts structured? How are they negotiated in a new era of price transparency? And so I guess to close my opening remarks, I, I like to tell everybody that there's a BC and an AD to price transparency. 
you know, the BC is everything before January 1st, 2021. And then the AD is everything after. So now that this new data is on the market, we can talk about how it's being used, how it's being cleaned up, and really how it's going to drive this new evolution of revenue cycle that's driven by price transparency. So thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, look, let's uh, help the some of the viewers out there that are just catching up a little bit. Uh, you gave that nice uh, metaphor, BCAD. Um, just to, I'll start, but you can maybe fill in a little bit here. As I, as I look at it, you, as you indicated, we had this hospital uh, transparency push starting all the way in the Obama administration, then accelerated during the Trump administration with a rule really forcing them to do what they call machine readable pricing disclosure. And then they added some requirements to it. And that, if I remember right, started at about 2019 in terms of them at least notionally being required to price all of that data. That was then followed by a reinterpretation of an old ACA law saying, hey, we can make the insurers also disclose a lot of data, which that was then the coverage and transparency rule that got issued also during the Trump administration. And then the Cures Act comes along and says, by the way, we also need good faith estimates. So when a patient goes into any provider and says, hey, I'm either uninsured or I want to pay cash, they can now presumably pretty soon start getting from those providers that went into effect in July of this year, uh, start getting estimates of how much it's going to cost out of pocket for them to pay directly cash for their services. And the provider who's the lead provider is supposed to f- help them figure that all out. Is that roughly where we are in terms of the three buckets of data now coming in? What other, what Rough, other things would roughly. you, would you add? Yeah. Yeah, roughly. So if you think of it, it's like a one-two punch and then a knockout punch. The the first, you know, jab was the hospital price transparency rule, one one twenty one. And as you mentioned, there were earlier iterations, and the courts really focused on this ACA definition of standard charges. And before 2021, standard charges was just meant to mean that hospitals charge master list price. And in the Trump administration, that was redefined to mean even the negotiated rates of you know, providers with insurance companies. And that's where, you know, our industry really opened our eyes and said, hey, if this happens, this is a big deal. And so the negotiated rates of all items and services were first required for hospitals, 1121, for payers, 7122. So just about three and a half months ago. And then mixed in between is this knockout punch that you mentioned. Uh, we call it the No Surprises Act. Um, and the No Surprises Act, uh, it has a lot of great things for patients. You know, you can't be billed out of network care. You don't know about in the emergency room and air ambulance services. And it also goes into um, some really nuanced ways for providers and payers to reconcile out of network care between the, the two entities. So even absent of the patient. And then it also gives patients the right to a good faith estimate um, for items and services. And those requirements are interesting because cash and uninsured good faith estimates went live January 1st of this year. And so if you are a patient who wants to pay cash and you have insurance, and maybe you've just seen that the cash rate is lower, you've now had nearly 10 months where you can walk into any provider and demand a good faith estimate. What the industry is waiting on is good faith estimates for insured patients. And that gets into another topic of advanced EOBs, which is basically telling what an insured patient would owe overlaying their cost share. And we're expecting that next year. And that's complicated in part because the provider has to work with the insurer. And, uh, you know, then it's really, is that, that's a calculation really about cost sharing uh, yeah. after the insurance payment is uh, litigated or reconciled, yep. uh, what's left for the patient to pay. And so that's a more complicated calculation, presumably. It's, it's very complicated. It makes you ask, it makes you take a step back and wonder as a patient in the US, why does it have to be that complicated? <laughs> and, you know, it, it basically demands claims reconciliation usually happens on the back end. So once the charges are added to your claim and adjudicated by the insurance, you learn what you owe three months after as a patient. What No Surprises is purporting to do for insured patients is move all of that to the front end for shoppable services. And so the technical considerations for the this portion of no surprises are 
numerous because you basically have to move claims reconciliation before the time of service, which gets interesting. Yeah, that's a, a heavy lift for all the parties involved who have never done anything like this. But certainly one would think if you're trying to help the consumer figure out, you know, what do I going to get out? You know, what do I need to do when I go in and see what am I going to owe? Uh, it's essential. So, you know, yeah. it, 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 we probably have the technology to do it. It's a question of that initial investment to set up the systems to make it happen. All right. Exactly. So. So here we are, we've got, we've got a lot of these uh, requirements coming out. There are a lot of stories from a year and a half ago, you know, maybe even, even this year, earlier this year, uh, sort of saying, sure, you know, you got all these rules out there, but nobody's paying attention to them. You know, that was kind of the theme a little bit. Uh, but of course, you know, everything takes, a, you know, it's a slow runway on these things. So what are you seeing? I mean, you're right in the thick of it. Um, how much is the industry... Uh, complying? How much are they dragging their feet? And maybe divided up between the 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 obviously the provider community and the and the insurer community. How are you seeing it play out? Yeah, uh, let's talk about hospitals first. So hospitals have had their day in the sun now for nearly two years, and we were ready in the beginning of 2021. All of our engineers were ready to check all the hospital websites. We called it the world's worst Easter egg hunt to go find all these machine readable files, download them, um, parse them into a standard format. And, you know, we were a very small company then, so we weren't very loud about our efforts and we weren't really talking to the press. And so early in last year, early of 2021, you saw some initial reports that said, hey, hospitals are not complying. Hospitals are ignoring this. Um, and for a lot of folks in the industry that were expecting immediate gratification, there was disappointment. Um, and so you asked, what am I seeing? I actually have our graph pulled up so I could look right at it, but we check every hospital every quarter. And so going back to first quarter 2021, we go to every hospital website and evaluate what they've posted on their site. And what you see is a pretty steady uptick. So 2000 hospitals by the end of the first quarter of last year had posted what we say is machine readable file data. And now we're looking at, at the uh, really the end of Q3, uh, 4,900 hospitals. And so that gets you, depending on you know how many hospitals you feel are subject to the rule, you're well over 80% of hospitals now have posted machine readable file data. And then to really bring this full circle, you asked, hey, there's a lot of different narratives in the press and there are two things to mention here. Number one is, you know, back in high school, I took I took a theater class and I took it pass fail, right? And so I took it pass fail because I'm not the best at theater. And the good thing about a pass fail class is it's really binary. Um, you either pass it or you fail it. And a lot of the narratives in the press are really doing a pass fail evaluation of hospital compliance. And there are there are some requirements of these files that are hyper specific. The files have to be named a certain way. They have to be located in a certain place on your website. Um, and what we're seeing in the press is really like a pass-fail trial where you've got some organizations out there evaluating hospital compliance. And if there's anything off, then they failed the hospital. And so that's at one end of the spectrum. And if you've seen press that like 14% of hospitals are compliant, you know, that's a, a pass-fail greater. Uh, it may be accurate, but the question is, you know, is it more important to highlight what we call significant or meaningful transparency, which is exhibited through this relevant um, plethora of negotiated rates data that's coming through machine readable file and the presence of a patient estimate tool on the website. And so if you grade on a slightly less pass, pass fail methodology, we're now seeing as many as 60, 65% of hospitals in the United States have published uh, have significantly uh, published transparent data on their website. And it, we're, we avoid the word complied because ultimately CMS is the only arbiter of that. But for anybody listening on this call, the good news is, you know, 65% of hospitals, and that skews mostly towards large hospitals, large health systems. A lot of the holdouts are now like the small critical access hospitals that don't have resources. What that means is such a swath of the hospital visits per year are now going through um, hospitals that have this data posted, which is it may be more reason for optimism. Good, 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 good. 
And then on the insurer side, it seems like it was even more sort of rapid and sort of ready to comply in part because I guess the, the insurer rule had a much more significant penalty for non-compliance attached to it. But tell us about that. Yeah, so the insurers were required to publish July 1st and um, it's all uh, insurers and then self-insured employers are also on the hook to publish for this as well. So many self-insured employers pointed to their TPA or their carriers to basically reference um, what those carriers or TPAs were saying. And then, and same thing, we were ready with our engineers on July 1st. And we saw a very different, you know, if you graph the hospitals over seven quarters, it's a steady uptick. With the insurers, it was almost day one. All insurers posted nearly all of the large insurers. And then by the end of the first two months, we saw a bunch of the regional uh, players that were a little late come online. And we have a statistic that we ran through with some of our covered lives data that over 90% of commercial covered lives are now um, represented in the insurer data. It's just three, uh, three months after the publishing date. And so we've seen a lot of compliance with the insurers. We've seen more of like two, there's can be too much of a good thing. Insurers publish so much data that the reason you maybe haven't heard about it is because, I mean, we've got 200 computers running concurrently in the cloud to process this data. Um, it's it's a heavy, heavy lift. And so it's not something that, you know, a couple people in a garage can really make sense of readily. Got it. Got it. Well, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is, you're not the only player, obviously. A lot of people are trying to figure out what does this all mean and then help the industry and maybe eventually consumers make some sense of it. And so I'm, I'm just in general terms, like if you're, if you're, uh, you know, you're a CEO of a data company that's trying to work through all of this, how do you, how do you think about how can I take this information and make it useful, usable and relevant and really actionable for the employer community first, and then maybe for the consumers. So maybe talk about the employers first, and also maybe a little bit of how, about how, how excited they are to get it. Yeah. And then, and then let's talk about the consumer, which is a really another whole different deal. So let's talk about the employers. How are they, how are you thinking about how to, how to make this helpful to them? Yeah. So first of all, one of the in most interesting quotes from the past three months is we had a, a jumbo employer reach out uh, from their benefits team. And someone said, once I read about what's in this data, I couldn't sleep at night and knowing we didn't have it, which is, that's how important it is to this large self-insured employer. And th the issue with employers is, you know, employers often have trusted consultancies that they work with. And so there's this almost like, we call it software development life cycle, but just this, this lag that happens where the data is published it's so large that it needs to be parsed and standardized, cleaned up, and then fed downstream in a way that folks can use it. And so um, with employers, we have a couple of different strategies. And I, I, for most employers I've talked to, they're not really doing this in-house because of how much uh, of an engineering commitment it takes, um, both people and capital. And so really the flow that you're seeing is Data aggregators like Turquoise, we're not the only one, are cleaning up the data, maybe passing it downstream to a partner. And so we've partnered with Milliman. Um, we've also partnered recently with a company called Inovu that works on behalf of self-insured employers. They're taking this cleaned up data and they're beaming it out in dashboards for employers. Um, and so what you're really seeing three and a half months in is just like the software and data development process finally making its way out to employers in a way that they can consume. Because if you point an employer at a large Redshift SQL database, they're going to look to their consultant or someone to say, hey, how do we make sense of this? Yeah, interesting. Um, and how is the take up amongst the employers? Are you seeing, are you seeing like just the sophisticated players? Are you seeing the national associations or big groups representing employers? How are they... How is the community, are they reacting? Or is it still just people still trying to figure out their play, so to speak? It kind of just feels like a general fervor of interest <laughs> um, all the way down to the smallest, the community of the smallest self-insured employers where you have benefits advisors, often small shops, um, working with small self-insured employers. 
And if you think about it, the way we think about this is like data access on a spectrum of engineering resources. So the smallest self-insured employer may be evaluating their reevaluating their carrier. Hey, should we go with Cigna or UHC? They're looking to their benefits advisor. And that benefits advisor ideally would just have a report or something in Excel to kind of pivot table and say Cigna versus UHC. The larger employers have a bit more resources, so they're going to pair uh, utilization data, claims data. They're going to evaluate multiple options in multiple geographies. Um, and we're seeing uptake all the way along that, spe that spectrum. And the hardest audience to get this to right now is the, the smaller um, side, I guess, like maybe a thousand employees or less, um, especially the ones that work with the the smaller uh, benefits advisories. And it's mainly just a data size issue. So how do they easily um, distill that large, large, large data warehouse into just the piece they need? Um, and that's Turquoise is working really around the clock to make it as simple as, you know, like Googling for um, payers and codes. Yeah, interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about I have sort of two parts on this. I want to hear about what you think about where, where is this going for consumers a little bit? And then, you know, in addition to what you're doing through Turquoise and the other aggregators working through the data, um, I, I understand just from media reports and other things that there are starting to percolate up sort of publicly accessible websites where the you know, sort of the average person can go online and start peeking in a little bit to what's going on with all of this. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, first of all, let's talk about the consumers and then we'll come back to these public access, publicly accessible tools that are starting to come online. Um, uh, talk about the consumers. What do you, what do you think? How, how, is this actionable yet or will it ever be actionable? Or, or there's some group out there that thinks they're kind of pessimistic that think oh, this will never be useful to the average consumer. Where, where are you on that spectrum? Yeah, so you, if, if, if you're kind of following along, you'll notice that we haven't really talked much even so far about the consumer. Um, we've talked about employers and in, in my intro, you mentioned the managed care contracting spin. The open secret in healthcare is that like the price of healthcare is rarely just a price. It's rarely like a menu item. Um, it's a formula and that formula changes and that formula depends on a few factors. Number one, it depends on the formula that the payer and provider have used to negotiate the price. And so that might be a percent of a fee schedule. It might be percent of charges. And that might be dynamic based off how many items and services are consumed during a patient's visit. Secondly, the price of healthcare for an insured patient is really determined by their benefits design. So if I have a copay heavy plan, and I know every time I go in a doctor's office, I owe $50 and only $50, great. I live in a price transparent world. If I have a plan with a complicated high deductible and then a 10%, 15% coinsurance, then you're really layering two formulas on top of one another. And what you create is an algebraic mess where it's impossible to know the price of care in advance. And so um, it we're not even taking into consideration the complexity of knowing which services will I get. If I show up at the doctor's office, or I show up for my knee meniscus repair, will I just get that 45 minute consult? Will I just get that knee meniscus um, procedure build? And so you have a lot of complexity. And when you read kind of naysayers in the press, they just stop there. They say, it's impossible. The system's broken. You'll never have consumerism. Um, patients don't want to be consumers of healthcare because it's categorically different from other things we purchase is another thing you hear. And in reality, there have been studies and um, also just user experience uh, experiments run where if you give patients um, a choice that says, you know, basically four pillars, quality, uh, access, meaning like how far away is it also, can I have the service Thursday or next Thursday or in three months? And then you also give them the price, the exact, this is what you're gonna pay price locked in the same way I tell people buying a toaster on Amazon, I know exactly what it's going to cost when it's going to arrive. If you give patients that information, lo and behold, uh, they act as consumers of healthcare, 
the same way that they uh, act as consumers of toasters and other things they might buy. And so the real problem before getting to true consumerism in healthcare is working your way through the complicated math to give consumers an upfront, all-inclusive price. And that's what we're working towards. I think there's a lot of work to do with those two formulas I mentioned, standardizing benefits, standardizing the payer provider contract to make the math cleaner for patients to choose healthcare. Um, so I'm not naysaying consumerism in healthcare. I think the price transparency rules put the right uh, pressures in place in the industry to create transparent benefit plans designs and transparent contracts. Yeah, interesting. But uh, let's get uh, drilling down on that just a tad further. Let's assume that we get to a little a place down the road where people can start to deliver that to the to the patient. That there'll be a little bit better way of pulling it all together into clear quality access price metrics that they can yep. instantly look at. Who's going to give that to them? Is it going to be the insurance plan they're signed up with? Is it going to be independent data companies like yourself? Um, who, who's going to make available to the average consumer the tool that can help them navigate it? I'm not sure. The insurers all have their own tools already. Yeah. But in some, in certain ways, they aren't doing exactly what you're talking about because they, they're kind of just their own network, so to speak. Uh, how, who's going to help the consumer get to where we need to go? Yeah. So what I'm excited for is they say that, um, if you had that one great customer experience, um, you're spoiled for the rest of your life. And once you get that in healthcare, once you have that one great experience where you needed that surgery and whichever interface it was, you mentioned a couple, the payer, the provider, some third party, and they spoil you with that experience where you knew the upfront price, you knew the quality, you're able to choose the time and you never saw a bill after the day of that service. Once you're spoiled once or twice, that will become the standard for the industry. And what I think we'll see is a lot of third-party innovation. So Turquoise, we're two years old. We just partnered with a company called Ribbon Health, and they're a little bit older, but they're a, a data provider as well. They, they combine our price transparency data with quality data information about the doctor, provider directory data, and then they sell that to... Uh, insurance plans and employers and even providers where you just have this consistent data experience. And I, so I think what you're going to end up seeing is that you'll experience this in a few places, maybe on the provider website, maybe on the payer website, but it might be powered by um, a few data providers, but that consistent experience will start being more pervasive across many interfaces. Interesting. Back, let me, I want to get to this public public tools that are out there in a minute, but uh, let's talk a bit about one thing you just mentioned, which is something I've always, I've been harping on for a while, which is um, showing my cards a little bit. Uh, standardization. Uh, you mentioned it would be, you know, if uh, if uh, if the consumer out there or even the payer community, if if what was being priced uh, was aggregated in a way that was more standardized. Uh, mm -hmm. instead of ad hoc, um, it would seem it would be a lot easier to do apples to apples comparisons, both for the payers and for the patients. Let me just talk through an example of what, what I mean. I mean, if, if you say, well, I, I want to compare pricing for a, a, a joint replacement surgery, um, you know, some of the providers might include certain services in the, in the all-in pricing and other providers might not. And so then a patient or a payer goes in and says, well, this one's charging a lot more. And they'll say, well, that's true, but that's because we give you X, Y, and Z. And the other pricing that you looked at doesn't include X, Y, and Z. And it becomes very difficult for the average lay person to then do a real apples to apples comparison. So standardization here seems to me to be critical. And then the big, so the big open question is, is it gonna bubble up from the ground? Are you, can folks like you help it get standardized or is this something, is this a next step regulation? Is this something the federal government should just sort of say, you know, we're going to go toward more understandable bundles of services that need to be priced and make everybody disclose what they would charge for it? Yeah, so this is something you and I have talked about quite a bit. It's, it's, it holds a place in my heart. So um, we mentioned, you know, 
fee for service healthcare a little bit. I don't think I've thrown out that term just yet, but the idea that whatever happens to you as a patient during a visit, you'll just be billed for every charge. And so there's kind of like a linear relationship between the amount of things that happen to you while you're in the hospital and what your bill ultimately becomes. And that drives a lot of healthcare and it really affects the way the patient pays. And the problem is exactly what you just said. If we get specific about the joint replacement, um, if I get an estimate at one place that might include some of the pre-op visits and some of the post-op physical therapy, at another place, it doesn't include those pre-op visits in the physical therapy. Um, the, with joint replacement, also there's a big implant prosthesis that's put um, in your knee or in your hip. And the cost of that implant uh, sometimes is not included in the estimate, which is actually bonkers to me. Um, and other times it is. And so there are these variables that drive uh, significantly a patient's estimate and to be able to make that apples to apples comparison, those estimates have to be standardized, but they also need to be the language across pairs and providers that everybody uh, speaks in. And so the problem is uh, twofold. Number one, the language that pairs and providers speak in right now is through these proprietary coding systems um, called CPTs for outpatient services that get super granular and they don't really lend well to these standard um, standard visits. And so if you're really comparing hyper-specific CPTs, it's at a level that the patient's never going to understand. Um, and then, you know, number two, it's the contracts. It always comes back to the contracts between payers and providers. Do you need to contract at the CPT level or can you contract at a more abstracted per visit level? And so um, with those problems, we go into, you know, the solution. What do we need uh, to facilitate the future of this like consumer driven price transparent ecosystem? We need standard service packages. So um, what we're working on is named just the same standard service packages. It's an open industry effort um, with a bunch of collaborators. And what we're doing is using claims data to look at the most common shoppable services. So there are about a thousand shoppable services um, 500 are required under these new laws here in the next uh, couple months. And we're looking at them, at them and saying, hey, based off claims data, what does the archetypal knee replacement look like? Colonoscopy, hysterectomy. What are the standard services that are included in that package? And can we get the whole industry on the same, we say the same rails, the same open source coding system to basically say, here is the standard knee replacement and if I am HSS in New York, the top, um, you know, orthopedic hospital in the United States, I can throw in five nights in a hotel, pre-op and post-op, a uh, box of chocolates, but that's on top of the standard service package. And so what's, what's interesting is it sounds super maybe new in healthcare to have this standard foundation, the way we talk about services, and then extend those foundations to add some bells and whistles. But it's the same thing that we see in flights, same thing that we see on Airbnb. You have this base level package. When I go on a flight, I expect a plane to take me somewhere. I expect a seat. I expect some sort of food, whether it's peanuts or something. And then everything else now is kind of a la carte on top of that. Do I want to, I want to sit closer to the front? Do I want um, more leg room? And what we'll see is the same sort of um, consolidating of healthcare services where there is a standard knee replacement. You can choose the implant with more bells and whistles. That's newer. Um, you can choose the hotel nights um, for convalescing. And I'm really excited for that. And the whole industry is excited for that as well, pointing towards it. And I think it's going to be good for the patient as well. Yeah, no, let's, let's just drill down a little bit more to make sure people understood. It seemed like what you're just talking about is huge, very, very important. So this SSP effort, standard service package effort, you think, as you just indicated, is sort of percolating along behind the scenes. It's not visible really to the public or even not reported much in, in press yet, the industry press. Um, how optimistic are you? I mean, uh, can, uh, how... What, what, what are we looking at here? Is this something where, you know, some of the big insurance players are involved, others? Will it become the norm sometime soon? Because I think if it were to be to reach that point, it really would be a very important pivot point. Yeah, 
Um, so to give everybody um, that's maybe interested in this like further reading, we're working on uh, standard service packages and we're moving very fast because like I mentioned, there's 500 required by transparency and coverage January 1st here in a couple of months um, and 500 is a lot. And uh, so we published an initial list of service packages in beta on servicepackages.health. And we published that for industry to review. Um, we're working with a bunch of surgeons and a, like you mentioned, some payers and providers, and there's a big coalition reviewing these service packages. And what they're doing is they're basically taking the output of our algorithms that have gone through claims data. They're clinically reviewing them. They're getting buy-in from industry. And there's a broader industry coalition called Project Clarity, which is doing what we're saying is industry consensus service packages. So basically, if ours, you could think of as whipping them up rapidly for the industry to review in beta, Project Clarity is adopting them as industry consensus, where you've got you know, surgeons, gastroenterologists, payers, providers saying, hey, these 20 we've adopted as industry consensus and then another 10. And so it's just this development flow and it's moving uh, fast, which is good. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I'm I'm eager to see it reach some uh, real milestones and deliver on it because I think that'll be a real a real change in the environment if they can get to that. Uh, so yeah. that's something to look forward to. Okay, let me ask you about one other thing that has come across my radar, and then I have some audience questions that have come in, some very good ones I want to get to. Um, I've heard about this tool that's out there that I think at least on on the website it says you participate, your company participates in called Sage Transparency Tool. Um, can you tell us anything about that? I don't mean to spring this on you. I didn't tell you I'd ask you about this no uh, beforehand. Yeah. So what, what does this say? It looks like a, something that might be useful just as a lay, lay person getting on to sort of say what's going on out there, especially on the hospital side. Yeah. So the Sage transparency tool, um, I think was mostly the brainchild of Gloria Sachdev at Employers Forum of Indiana, who's su- always been super forward thinking about price transparency. And she pulled together efforts from Turquoise, Rand, Mathematica, and a couple different data sources to create a free dashboard um, of transparency data. And I'm also, she also brought in Marilyn's work at Nashby, a, a, bu- a bunch of different sources to basically say, hey, anybody, employers, um, you know, folks in DC, take a look at this dashboard to get a high level view of transparency. And it's it's been very successful. I've heard a lot about it. We were happy to be a part of it. Um, there's and it's free, which is great. Everybody loves free. Uh, there's certain great data points that she brings in. Um, the RAND data is very reputable. Um, but the one thing we did at Turk was like it, it's a slightly higher level data set. And so if I recall, you can look at clinical categories, you know, inpatient joint replacement, stuff like that. And this is really like what we mentioned the higher level view that helps some of these smaller employers get a picture of transparency, patients, et cetera. And so, you know, there's a couple efforts like that. There's also an open source effort on Dolt Hub to collect these prices. So there are free places to go look and start using this transparency data. Um, And we're happy to participate in the SAGE study. Of course, you know, the turquoise data, the big database is much um, just bigger. There's more data points and we shared an extract to the Sage dashboard. Got it. I, now I yeah. understand what's going on. So the, basically, we're talking about a tool that will allow someone to get a general idea that, you know, in my market, uh, Hospital A is, you know, on yep. average across these services, twenty five percent more expensive than Hospital B. That's you know ten miles away or something like that. Yes. that's sort of what it would do. Exactly. And then yeah. I think if if you want to ask like the more hyper targeted like for these CPT codes, Anthem you know, HMO versus PPO in Tulsa, then a larger data source will probably help you. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, All right, so we got a couple of interesting uh, audience questions here. Let me try this one for you here. It says, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the big picture and the industry and so on. How will this play out, uh, you know, in the provider's office? Probably presumably talking about a physician maybe. Uh, How soon will a doctor be able to discuss with the patient which treatment options are the least costly? In other words, could physicians who are obviously that really the, this is an interesting question because it's sort of like, 
the, the physician maybe, are they going to be helpful to the patients in this, in this effort? Yeah. Are, and can we help the ph physicians be helpful to patients saying, you know, you don't really need to spend, you know, $3,000, you know, driving, driving here, you know, go, go another four miles and you'll save yourself a lot of money. I mean, are physicians going to be in a position where they can be helpful in this regard and how? Yeah. So you probably a lot of folks have noticed that very few physicians are literate in the nuances of price, healthcare pricing. Um, and it's no fault of their own. The system's so complex, they've already got a lot of things they need to be good at. The good news is with some of the requirements of the No Surprises Act coming online uh, next year and that have already come online, you as a physician will have the resources at your disposal, at least within your office to say, hey, you know, Jim wants an estimate. Um, can we can we get him one? It might not next year be as simple as the physician sitting, you know, next to you during your visit, looking at the EHR saying, hey, so I'm looking up some options, you know, this one versus this one. They can do that right now sometimes for prescription drugs. But uh, next year, you'll probably see it as, hey, go get an estimate from the front office. In 2024, 2025, We'll certainly see it at the time of referral with the patient sitting there, you know, bedside saying, let's look at your options and how much they'll cost you. Interesting. Uh, that's amazing. Um, we have another interesting question, which is relevant because, you know, for the average consumer out there, a lot of times the thing that's most visible to them, the one that they really see very clearly is the cost of the, especially retail prescription drugs that they have to, uh, you know, that their doctor tells them they, they should be taking. Um, and obviously there's, it's in the political news, a lot about drug pricing and so on. Is there a play for drug pricing in these tra transparency efforts? Where is, is there some, um, uh, obvious, uh, especially maybe from the, the payer or the insurer side, is that going to help people have a better window into, um, some potential savings on prescription drugs? Yeah. So the first thing for everybody to know is the payer price transparency rule uh, that went live on July 1st, which includes uh, all negotiated prices for medical services with all providers, was originally also supposed to have negotiated prices for all prescription drugs. There was a third, you know, the forgotten stepchild file. And unfortunately, some lobbying drove that requirement away. I think officially it's been pended for further rulemaking, but in the industry, we've felt that it's dead because we haven't heard anything on it. And that was a huge setback for uh, people that want uh, to comparison price or comparison shop for prescription drugs. There's a couple of good things happening. Um, the first good thing, like I mentioned, is because drug pricing is working generally off one code, you do have some EHRs that bake in the price of the drug at the time of talking to the patient. So that's that's a good thing is it's a little bit less guesswork for the physician. The Inflation Reduction Act is focusing on Part B and Part D drugs over the next 10 years and bringing down some of those prices. And then there is a piece of the no surprises rule that requires, I think it's like 50 prescription drug prices per payer to be published. It's just a little bit more diluted than the original requirement, which was all prescription drugs. So we're still hoping for more rulemaking on a good comparison shopping experience for that. Yeah, no, it seems like there might've been a short-sighted effort that uh, they knocked that out and then they ended up, getting, <laughs> they may get yeah. worse. They may get worse from uh, the legislative response if uh, transparency isn't uh, useful in bringing down the prices. Well, yep. I'm going to give you the final word here. We're, we're running right up against our, our time and I want to be respectful of your time and everybody else's time. Yeah. Uh, you've been, this has been very informative. It's been great, but let's a uh, big picture. I mean, yeah. this seems like a big moment in healthcare, Huge. the industry. Um, how are you feeling about things? I mean, it seems you've been, been at it two years. Where are you? How are you feeling? Where do you think it's going to go next? Yeah. So to us, this is a five-year process, the initial adoption phase of price transparency, getting it in front of patients. We're two years in. We have a lot of reason for optimism. We shouldn't expect immediate gratification. The moment these laws come live, it can't just be like the data is living in every software application. And so folks in this call have reason to be optimistic. And the, the final thing to walk away with is the fact that companies like Turquoise are incentivized to exist, to raise funding, to hire really talented people, to make the experience better for patients, employers, et cetera. 
is not something that existed two years ago. These laws created that market. And so we like to tell people there's a market for transparency and it's finally, it's finally working. Terrific. That is a, a great final word. Thank you, Chris, very much. We look for, we'll follow your work and look forward to uh, where all this goes in the coming months and years. So thank you again Thanks for so your willingness to come on today. Uh, that will conclude our session. Um, thank you all for joining us.